Were the Anglo-Saxons? Well, there are two answers to that. One is a very simple one. Bede, in his History of the English-Speaking Peoples, tells us that the Anglo-Saxons were the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. And he says that these people come from Angeln, which is basically southern Denmark. Um, Saxony, which is more or less what we regard as, as, as Saxony nowadays, in other words, the area around Hamburg, and Jutland, which is obviously north Jutish Peninsula. That used to be what everybody accepted, but archaeology has rather complicated that, that picture. And we no longer really believe that the, the majority of the Jutes came from Jutland. In fact, archaeologically, they seem to have more links with Frisia, in other words, modern Holland. And even if you look at the other groups, they're not pure groups of Angles, Saxons and Jutes, the Angles settling in, in the north of England on the whole, the Saxons settling in Essex, Sussex, and further to the west of that. In fact, you find a much more mixed pattern. And what you've got to really envisage is a group of barbarian peoples on the continent in the 5th and early 6th centuries tribal groups which are always changing complex, complexion, complexity, joining other groups. And these groups gradually forming larger groups which migrate and which in time will define themselves in the way that Bede defined, themselves, defined them, but which were not defined in that way at all in the 5th and 6th centuries during the period of migration when they come over to England. actually a history education centre which has been running now for about 10 years. We started in about 1985 um, using history as a way of interpreting the past for people, living history as a way of interpreting the past. We've only been on the present site here at the Farming Museum for about three years uh, and that's been long enough time to build a village and establish some crops and get some livestock but the plan for the next few years is to extend the site and actually make it bigger and better research more accurate ways of building the buildings uh, and get better livestock and better crops. Um, the village is actually based around a settlement of the Dark Ages. Um, we have a major problem in studying the Dark Ages in that there's no written records, very few written records, that give detail about how people lived or what they got up to, um, what they ate or, or what jobs they did. Um, history of that period tends to be very much about kings battles, dates, and while those are important uh, in their own right, they only make up about 5% of what was actually going on. So a study of those dates and kings and battles doesn't really tell you a lot about the daily life of people, about what they were doing. Even a king had to have somebody to sort of clean his throne for him and stoke his fire for him. Um, so what we tend to do here is steer away from the dates and the statistics and get more onto the daily life of people what it was like to actually live a thousand years ago, how people actually made their daily bread, as it were. Um, and for that purpose, we've constructed a Dark Age settlement, which we tell people when they arrive is not real. Uh, it's impossible, impossible to build a real Dark Age settlement and get it absolutely right. Even the, the real experts would have to admit they couldn't do it because we just don't know enough about their buildings. When we come to excavate buildings in archaeology, what we actually find are the floors and the walls up to a height of three or four feet. We never find the roofs intact. And of course, the buildings had fallen into disuse before they fell apart. So what you're finding is very fragmentary evidence. It's a bit like looking at a jigsaw puzzle with half of it's missing. You get a vague idea of what there is there, but the precise details are often missing. Uh, and for that, we have to use a fair amount of educated guesswork. The site is actually visited by 15,000 children a year who all spend the best part of a day out on the village living as Saxon or Viking or Dark Age people would have lived. And it's quite an eye-opener for children, because for, particularly if they come from inner cities, they've never actually encountered livestock at close range. They've never encountered 
some of the jobs they have to do. I mean, in, in our world in 1995, we live in a very push-button world. If you want to get warm, you switch up the thermostat. If you want to get some food, you go down to the supermarket. Uh, if you want some clothes, you go down to the shops and buy them. Our ancestors couldn't do that. And a thousand years ago, their priorities were staying warm, staying clothed and staying fed. But there were no shops to get their food from. Uh, there were no tailors to go to, to buy the clothes off the peg. And you certainly hadn't got a thermostat for essential heating. They had to get it all for themselves. So it would have been a fairly arduous life for them, which is probably why their lives were shorter than ours and harder work. Everything, everything had to be wrestled from the land. It was a constant battle against starvation. People talk about warriors and battles and kings, but the biggest killer uh, in the Dark Ages was probably disease and starvation, but it wasn't battle. The battles themselves were few and far between. Um, the biggest enemy was starvation. People spent 90% of their working day fighting against that enemy. That is a big enough enemy without needing anything else. We base our business on two principles, really. The first is that if you were a teacher with a class of children and you were going to teach cookery, you wouldn't just give them a recipe book. Because if you did, they'd get bored with it. They'd want to try the recipes out. You cook. Well, we do the same thing with history here. We don't just talk about it, we do it. Um, you have to have careful bounds for that. You have to set parameters out. Otherwise, you could be giving them the wrong idea. And that's why when we get people on the site, we explain it's not a real village. We're not real Dark Age people. We're recreating the atmosphere of what it would have been like. Otherwise, you could be giving them the wrong impression. Um, the second principle we base our business on is a famous Chinese philosophy, which is used a lot in education. And that's, I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. But if I do, I understand. Now, that is written through everything we do. That is our fundamental philosophy. They've got to do it to understand it. It's no good pointing to a field and saying to a group of children, that needs to be tilled in order to grow your crops. You've got to throw them a tool and say, get on with it, because if you don't work, you're not going to eat, which was the philosophy our ancestors had. If they didn't get out and do it, no one was going to bail them out. I didn't have any government to bail them out in that respect, the way it happens today in some, some cases. They had to get out there and do the job themselves. 95% of the population a 1,000 years ago were getting their living from the land. Essentially, they were farming. They might have been part-time traders, they might have been part-time blacksmiths or carpenters, but even kings owned farms. And even a king, if he didn't get his hands dirty farming, would still take an interest in his fields and his crops and the way his land was being used, because it was the only way of getting food. So at the end of their working day here, they've, they've had a day working on the village, living as people have lived. They've had a banquet meal here, which we've arranged for them sort of food people might have eaten then. Obviously children won't eat all the things that they've had, but we give them a meal that's fairly accurately researched. And at the end of the day, they take home with them um, some flour ground from grain that's been grown on the village. They take home a sample of grain from the fields, they take home this flour they've ground, and they take home a little bread bun they've baked from the flour. They take home a bundle of twigs that they've collected in the fields. These aren't any normal twigs. These are twigs the children have collected themselves in the fields. And they also take home textile samples that they've worked on. Carded wool, spun wool, woven wool. So what they actually take home with them, in only small samples, but it's enough. They take home their achievement for the day. They take home things for staying warm, staying clothed and staying fed. And in all the cases, the things they take home are things they've made for themselves. They've not just seen it happen, they've done it for themselves. So it's I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, but when I do, I understand. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicles are a difficult document. At first sight, it tells us the whole history of the Anglo-Saxons right the way through from the year dot through to the uh, period 893. And it's then actually continued right the way up into the 11th and in one manuscript up into the 12th century. And at first sight, you therefore have a whole history of the Anglo-Saxon period. The difficulty with this is that it was composed in a particular period of time. It's composed sometime in 892 to 3, almost certainly commissioned by Alfred or somebody at Alfred's court, 
as a document responding to the crisis of the Viking invasions. And what you have, therefore, is a history drawn together for a very particular reason, a propagandist reason, to unite the people of Wessex, of, of Alfred's kingdom, in a particularly crisis period. In that period, it's not terribly surprising that everything is slanted to Alfred's point of view. And you actually have, therefore, a history of Wessex, yes, very definitely, but a history of Wessex which is made up of stories which may well have been put in the wrong years or which may have been invented altogether. There are certain points you can see in the early part of it where you're dealing with pure invention. For instance, the uh, figure called Port, who lands and founds Portsmouth, is quite clearly uh, simply a, a way of explaining the name Portsmouth. The man Vector, who um, lands in the Isle of Wight, um, the insula Vectis, is quite simply a man who ex explains the name of the Isle of Wight. So there are passages like that which are easy enough to discount. There are other passages relating to battles, particularly relating to battles associated, say, with Chorlin, um, one of the early figures in the West Saxon dynasty, which may or may not be true, and which may or may not be placed in the right period. We're not quite certain whether the chronicler had any good reason for putting things in specific dates, or whether he just found a series of nice empty spaces in the 5th century and in the 6th century into which he could fit convenient stories. And that seems to be what happens in the early um, histories of Kent and also of Wessex, which you find in the Anglo-Saxon chronicle. Well, there would have been an enormous variation in the types of settlement people lived in those days, depending on where you lived uh, and what sort of settlement it was, the size of the settlement. They, they did vary enormously. Um, in the main, the buildings in any settlement would have been made from materials that were locally available within 10 miles of where the settlement was built. So in an area where you've got a lot of stone lying around, upon moorlands and places like that. The buildings would have been constructed of stone, a lot of stone in them. In an area where it was heavily forested, they'd have used a lot of trees. I mean, they, they weren't going to start shifting equipment hundreds of miles when they got materials locally available. Um, some Dark Age settlements, Anglo-Saxons particularly, were called burgs or fortified settlements. They would have had a wall and a ditch around them, and they were a defended settlement. Um, others were just like a, a linear village. It was just a straggle of houses down a road, or well, well, I say road, a track. Communication was very difficult a thousand years ago. There were no such thing as proper roads. Um, and people were lucky to move 30, 40 miles a day if they were a royal messenger, let alone a, a, a farmer or some local. One thing you would have found on entering an Anglo-Saxon village, whether it was a straggle of village houses down a main street or a large settlement with a fortified wall around it, one thing a modern person would be surprised at is just how much of the actual building space was given over to storage of equipment. Uh, we have supermarkets to store our things in today, they didn't. Um, and, and a fair proportion of every house and every building was given over to storage of things like fodder for the animals and bedding, um, spare food. Uh, most people had a hayloft in these farm, in the farmhouses and in there you'd store most of your food uh, for the year. If that was empty, so was your stomach. Um, the buildings themselves very often uh, timber construction or stone walls with a timber roof thatched with straw or with turf, as we've never found any roofs intact. Uh, we wouldn't know, we don't know exactly how they, they did work the roofs, how they built them, um, but it appears that many of them were, were turfed or thatched. So the villages themselves, that have been single family dwellings, there might have been some, some villages actually we think now had a large hall which was like a central dwelling place and then around it scattered with small workshops and private sort of sleeping areas for people so they could go off and be on their own or little family units. But it varied enormously. In some places it was one family, one house. In other places it was communal living in a hall with little sleeping quarters off. Um, but they did, they did vary enormously. An actual Anglo-Saxon house would have been made of either stone or timber. My, my experience of construction comes from timber, so if we deal with timber ones, um, 
the houses were all constructed along a very basic, or often constructed along a very basic design, and that is you would, when you were building a house, you would start off by digging post holes. The archaeologists often say the study of the Dark Ages is pits, post holes and bones, because they're the only things they find. Post holes were dug, so you could sink a trunk of a tree or something as a post for one of the uprights of a house. Uh, the interesting thing we find is that in many places when they dig these post holes out, they find that the post hole is no deeper than a man's arm. They obviously weren't making life difficult for themselves. They weren't going to dig anything deeper than they could scoop out. You'd then put a stone in the bottom of it to act as a foundation. And then in would go your timber beams and upright. And then fill the earth in with cobbles and rubble. Pack cobble earth and rubble around Hammer Hall in to hold the post upright. A series of uprights. And then you'd put a cross rail around the top, a wooden cross rail around the top. So you've almost laid like a wood henge. From that you then had to fit the sloping beams of the roof, we assume because they've never found a roof intact, although it's a fairly safe assumption they were V-shaped roofs. Um, um, the roofs themselves would then have lats running across them, which were probably made of something like hazel or willow, something good and springy, solid that you could walk up. And onto that you would then attach your thatch. The walls themselves were infilled either with cut planks, which would have been an expensive way of doing it, because somebody had to cut those by hand, or they would have used wattle. Um, around every village there would have been an area of woodland that was deliberately managed as what we call coppice. They would cut trees down to a very low level, trees particularly like hazel or willow trees, and let new shoots spring out. And every so many years they'd cut these shoots off and they made thin springy branches, very straight. And it's from those that people even today make wattle hurdles or panels. They would have wattled the walls of the houses in some cases, planks in some cases, in other cases wattling. And then onto that wattle you smear a gooey mess of mud and straw. You can use animal dung. Um, animal dung has a lot of little creepy crawlies living in it which help to create air pockets in the mud because the main job of daub of mud and straw is it's like a giant mud aero bar. It's like a giant mud honeycomb. You put it on the walls up to a foot thick or more eventually. You apply a layer every so often. What you get is a very thick mud honeycomb and the air acts like cavity wall insulation. It keeps heat in in the winter and it keeps the, the house cool in the summer. But that needs to be protected. They used to put a lime wash on the door, which hardened it almost like cement. But it still needed to be protected from the worst of the weather, from frost and from rain. And that's why in many illustrations you actually see um, a very overlapping roof. The eaves of the roof come down a long way. And that's to give a lot of protection to the walls and also to help balance the structure because, of course, there were no proper foundations to them. So the mud and straw daubing actually acts as insulation to keep the air temperature regulated indoors. There would have been a door to a building, very often probably only one door, a door for in or out, and there's a lot of argument about whether they had windows or not in them. They certainly didn't have glass in them, but the, we found from practical experience here on, on the village that if you want to do things like weaving or delicate sewing or food preparation or anything, and the weather's too bad to go outside and do it in the open air. You can't do it in a gloomy, dark house. You need some sort of light. So um, the big argument about whether they had windows or not, we tend to put wooden shutters in our houses at certain points, which can be kept shut to keep the weather out, but can also let a fair amount of daylight in for delicate jobs that need to be done. So whether they had wooden shutters or not, we're not entirely sure. We found from our experience it helps. Um, although the houses varied enormously in shape and size, well, certainly in size, they all had roughly the same layout inside. It would be an earth or clay floor. Um, some parts of the year they may have put rushes or straw on to act as an insulation because the earth would get damp. But in the main it was a packed hard clay floor. Uh, and in the centre of the house there would have been a fire pit, a long fire pit. The fires our ancestors burned were remarkably sophisticated things. Many people today think you just light a fire and that's it. You don't. A fire is a very controllable thing. Uh, and if you're going to have a fire inside a house, you've got to try and have a fire that produces minimum smoke with maximum heat and also you want a lot of light off it. Now, as anyone who's ever cooked over a charcoal barbecue will know, you don't cook over open flames because that scorches the food but doesn't cook it through. So in a long fire pit, which could be four or even five feet long and two feet wide, there would be a, probably a central fire burning which provided light and as the wood burnt down there, it, the ashes, the hot ashes, like the charcoal in a barbecue, were scraped down, further down the fire pit to provide the heat for various cooking jobs that were going on. Most Anglo-Saxon houses were probably a combined kitchen, storeroom, dining room, living room, bedroom, stable, workshop, mill and barn, all rolled into one. 
The only thing they probably didn't have in them was a toilet pit, because until the invention of the flushing toilet, nobody wanted a toilet pit inside the house. But they were basically doing a lot of the jobs that houses do today. The difference between the houses we live in today and the houses they lived in is in degree rather than kind. Their houses may not have looked like ours, but they were doing the same jobs as our houses, as our houses do. There were laws in Anglo-Saxon society. There must have been some before the first written codes that we've got. There must have been lawmen who knew traditional law and who enforced it in some way or other. But the earliest code we've got is a code of Athelbert of Kent, and that is almost certainly written down as a result of the missionaries coming to England, bringing literacy with them. The Code of Athelbert begins with a, with a long section on the church, and clearly these missionaries have actually managed to get their oar in fairly firmly to defend the privileges of the church. But after that, it's largely a list of compensations, the sort of thing that you have to pay when you've cut off a neighbour's thumb or something like that. That kind of law continues with a second code which comes from Kent later on in the 7th century, and then with a code also in the 7th century from Wessex. After that, you have a real problem in trying to follow the history of Anglo-Saxon law, because Offa, the great king of Mercia, in the second half of the 8th century, is said to have compiled a law code. But we don't actually have a manuscript of it. The chances are that it was in some way connected to a big church council, for which we do have the church canons. Now, the great collection of, of law codes that we have, and indeed the reason why we have most of these early law codes, comes from Alfred's reign. Alfred puts together all earlier law into a law code of his own. And it's a very special code because it is deliberately a code bringing together the law of the peoples of Kent, of Wessex, of Mercia, to show that he was the rightful ruler of all these areas. But it's really after Alfred, it's with his son, Edward the Elder, and his grandson, Athelstan, that you start to get a change in law you then find that kings start issuing something which look much more like edicts. They're actually codes issued in specific years dealing with very specific issues. And these run right the way through the 10th century. You have a whole cluster of them at the end of the century, and you also find them in the reign of Canute in the beginning of the 11th century. And these codes are very largely influenced by a man called Wolfstan, who was in fact Archbishop of York, and they tend to have a very large, very considerable religious input into them. And really it's with Wolfstan's work that the history of Anglo-Saxon law comes to an end. It becomes obvious from examining the clothing, the sort of techniques that they had to work with it were, very, were, were fairly limited. Um, the materials particularly were limited. We're used to having dozens of different types of material today. In the main, in those days, it was wool or linen. Small amounts of silk were imported, but in the main it was wool or linen. The linen was grown from the flax plant, which they grew in fairly large quantities. They also used it for fire lighting. And the wool, of course, came off the backs of sheep. Um, the sheep of the Dark Age period often didn't need shearing. The wool actually came off in your hands. Um, and although it had a very short staple, as it's called, the wool was actually that long off a lot of the sheep. It's, we've, we have some sheep at our village which, which are very similar to the sheep of that period, and the, the wool is of very high quality. Um, if we start at the feet with Anglo-Saxon clothing for the man, and we'll talk first about the shoes. Shoes are made of various types of leather, um, and one of the things that we found through trying to be Dark Age people, or well, not trying to be them, but living as Dark Age people in the 20th century, is that footwear doesn't last very long. Uh, our ancestors obviously never walked a lot on gravel or tarmac or, or uh, cobbles and things like that because if they did their shoes would have worn out very quickly. Um, we discovered that if we copied original shoes taken from excavations and we copied them accurately with the stitching and the leather, the shoes wore out very quickly in daily use. Seven days a week our staff are wearing them and they very quickly wear out. So what we've had to do is cheat slightly. Like so many other things we do here, we've had to actually effect a compromise. And we freely admit it. If, if you look at the shoe I'm wearing, it's a fairly accurate copy of a boot from the Dark Age period. Um, it's sewn by hand, it's, it's stitched properly using thick pig skin. But we've had to put a sole on it with nails in. <laughs> 
because otherwise this boot would last me three weeks. As it is, this one's lasted me a year and it's already been through one set of soles. Because we're walking around, you're not driving in a car or anything, you're on foot all day, so it starts to wear out. We think what they probably did was they put a lot of sheep fleece in the bottom of the shoe. Not only did the lanolin in the sheep fleece help to waterproof the feet, it also provided a springy pad to walk on and it helped keep the feet from too much mud or mess. But they certainly probably, their, their boots certainly weren't waterproof, they would have certainly leaked in bad weather. So they would have expected to get muddy and wet feet. Trousers for men, um, there were styles for tight trousers and styles for fairly baggy trousers. Um, but in the main, a lot of Anglo-Saxon men cross gartered their legs. Now there's been a lot of speculation why they did this. Um, partly for decoration, there's no explaining decoration sometimes. Fashions change as they do today, they did then, although their fashions change a lot more slowly because they hadn't got access to as much cloth to change their fashions. But um, cross gartering the legs was probably very fashionable. It's also helps to stay warm in the winter because it cuts down drafts up the trouser leg and keeps the wool next to the skin. But it's also very functional if you're working out in the fields or you're working around bramble hedges or something, you catch your clothing. And by cross gartering, we found in our living on our village today, as we do, cross gartering makes your legs a lot more comfortable. A man would then wear perhaps a linen undershirt, which is what this is I'm wearing here, a linen made of linen, which is a lot finer, better next to the skin. And then for really cold weather you'd wear a heavier overshirt, which could go down as far as the knee. But the length of shirts and tunics did vary. Sometimes they had braid around the edge, sometimes they were just left plain. It obviously depended on what you were going to be doing. Um, fairly rich people would have several sets of clothing. Most of the sort of normal people would probably be looking to own one set, full set. Um, a belt around the waist, probably with a metal buckle, could even be of antler or bone. The one I'm wearing is made of deer antler and so is a strap end. It's made of deer antler. And then a cloak. Uh, there were various ways of, ways of wearing a cloak. I'm wearing mine on the shoulder with a brooch called a penannula. Penannulas have a break in them, whereas an annular brooch was a full ring. Both types were worn, although the Saxons tended to favour annular, brooch, favor annular brooches. For the women, it was shoes again, and they were not entirely sure about underwear, but they certainly wore a long gown that went very near to the ankle. And then for Anglo-Saxon women, there was a choice of either a tube dress, which is just like a tube of material with straps over it, or developed from that the wraparound apron which is an apron that goes three quarters of the way around the body but is left open at one side. Very often the dresses had a drawstring around the neck and this is so women could actually open the drawstring to feed young children. They could feed them, put them under the apron to feed them because they weren't bottle feeding them in those days very much. It was, it was almost certainly natural feeding. Um, the women would wear some jewellery. Both men and women liked jewellery. It wasn't just worn to look nice. It was a way of displaying wealth. Women tended to wear a device called a wimple, or a garment called a wimple, um, which covers the head and the, and the back of the neck and just leaves the face exposed. Um, now, there is an argument that a lot of this was to do with the early development of Christianity and that women weren't supposed to show their hair. But a more practical reason we found for Dark Age women is that they were working over open fires and a lot of them had long hair. And if you bend over an open fire with long hair, you're going to lose it. So they wore a wimple to protect their hair. For the same reason, the apron. The apron was probably there to protect them from the ash and the dust and the dirt and the heat when they were working around the fire all day. You could even, uh, the women who work on our village find that they often use their apron to grab a panhandle or something because it might be hot or dirty. So the apron gets dirty and not your clothing underneath. The religion of the Anglo-Saxons well, that changes. You've got to envisage that when the Anglo-Saxons leave the continent in the 5th and 6th centuries, they're essentially a pagan group of peoples from North Germany. And as far as we know, they worshipped Thor, Woden, perhaps Saxonet, who seems to have been the god of the Saxons. We know very little about their religion. Obviously, the Christians who wrote down accounts of the early Saxon period didn't actually want to record what was to be recorded about paganism and therefore we're basically left to use what we can from things like place names we find occasionally the name Woden or Thor in place names sometimes archaeology helps us though surprisingly less than one might have expected as yet no 
pagan temple has been discovered. And it may be that there wasn't much in the way of temple building for the Anglo-Saxons, though they may have used some Roman buildings, leftover Roman buildings for cultic purposes. We know a little bit more about their burial rites, which must include some sort of religious practices. Um, we know that the Angles tended to cremate people, and this obviously tells us something about religious practices. But on the whole, our evidence is very, very slight. There's only one major story in Bede relating to paganism, and that is when Edwin is converted, and the high priest, Coifi, borrows a spear from the king, which he should not have carried. He mounts a stallion, which he should not have ridden, and rides up to the temple at Goodmanham and throws his spear into it, desecrating it. And that's one of the two stories in Bede. There's one other about King Redwald, who supposedly had an altar in a temple to Thor as well as one to Christ. But that may even have been a Christian building, which was actually paganized rather than a pagan temple which was Christianized. We're much better off once we come to the religion of the, of the Saxons after they convert to Christianity. In other words, after the Roman mission arrives in 597 in Kent, and after the mission from Iona comes to Northumbria in the years after 634. What you have then is a very considerable Christian tradition based on bishops, yes, also very significant monasteries, parishes only be gradually beginning to evolve. Now the Christian history that we can see in all this is very largely a monastic history, and that's again because our sources tend to be monastic. We tend to see things through the eyes of Bede or through the eyes of other writers of saints' lives who once again tend to be uh, monastic figures. And what, what we see there is really a very literate society, a society um, cultivating Latin, the writing works on the scriptures, transcribing the scriptures and producing some of the most famous books that were ever produced in the Middle Ages, things like the Lindisfarne Gospels. The food that they ate in those days would have varied depending on where you lived. Uh, if you lived near a coastal in a coastal region, there'd have been a lot of seafood because the fish was readily available. If you live near a river, as most settlements were based near rivers, there would have been a lot of freshwater fish. You would even use a lot of shellfish. There's evidence in archaeological digs of, of, of oysters and mussels and quite a lot of other types of shellfish being eaten, even inland. Uh, but in the main, it was farm produce. It was what you could grow around you or get wild from the woods that you would eat. The diet was seasonal. Um, there would have probably been a glut of food for people around September, October, traditional harvest time. And in fact, in the Viking Icelandic calendar, that time of the year was called slaughter month, October. And that's when they killed off all the animals they couldn't keep over the winter months and, and, and salted the meat down to keep it for the winter. Correspondingly, in February, that time of the year was known as fat sucker, moral sucker, when people were losing weight. So their diet varied not just in what they ate, but in, in, in the seasons. We're used to getting apples all year round now. It would have been unlikely they could have done that then, even if they preserved them. Um, the types of food they ate, in the main, cereal crops were grown. Uh, the further north you go in the world, the less chances of growing them. You go up to Iceland, you can't get a lot to grow at all. Uh, in England, there was a fair amount of cereal crops grown. Um, there was barley, there was rye, there was a type of early form of wheat, not like the wheat we have today, uh, and there was oats were sown. Um, these cereal crops went to make the two, two of the basic staples of life, and that was bread and beer. The crops then have to be harvested by hand at harvest time around August, cut down by hand and stacked in the fields in stooks to dry, and it would then be brought in and stored in the barns and the lofts in the village where it would be brought out and threshed when it was needed. Threshing it involved using a flail, which is like two sticks, joined with a piece of leather in the middle. Uh, and you would flail the stoop to get the grain off the stalks. The stalks could then go for animal bedding or for thatching. Very little was wasted in a dark age village. So the grain having been threshed then had to be winnowed. That involves throwing it in the air and catching it. And the chaff, the bits that are inedible, are blown away in the wind. They could be gathered up and used for animal food then, mixed with bran. Uh, the grain then had to be put into a quern, which was like two stones with a sloping inner face. Um, the grain was poured into a hole in the top, the quern was turned round, 
and the action of the two stones turning together broke the grain down into its flour. It's the same principle that the big flour mills use today, but they've got enormous several tonne stones powered by electric motors. This was a hand-powered quern, and it could take several hours to get enough flour for one big loaf of bread. So somebody, somewhere, each day was having to grind that flour fresh. So the bread was then baked in flat cakes around the fire. There were peas and beans grown in the fields and some basic root vegetables, uh, things like uh, onions, uh, cabbages were grown. Um, not the extensive range of vegetables we had today, and of course no tomatoes, no potatoes, nothing like that. And these could be used to make a fairly tasteless vegetable stew, <laughs> which they would boil, not realising they were boiling the goodness out of it, because they knew nothing about vitamins or nutrient contents of food. They were just going on what was available. It wasn't choice, it was necessity. You could boil a stew of vegetables, flavour it with herbs. One of the big problems uh, in, in the Dark Ages was metal cooking pots were very valuable. Uh, they were either kettles, which were made up of bits of metal riveted together, fire welded together, or cauldrons which were cast, but they were extremely expensive things to own. And a lot of Dark Age women made do with cooking in a wooden bucket. Now, this is a technique which baffles people today um, until it's demonstrated to them. And it does show that our ancestors were far more sophisticated than we give them credit for. What you basically do is put a large stone in the fire and leave it in there for several hours. A lot of these stones that we find when they dig up archaeological sites today have turned pink and cracked because of the heat. And a lot of them have a hole in them. They'd bored a hole in it so that you could slide a rod through to lift it out of the fire. Because by the time that stone came out of the fire, it was glowing. And the stone may look dirty when it comes out of the fire, covered in ash, but it's as clean as a surgeon's knife is that stone. Because the temperature is such that nothing would live on it. That stone is then taken over to the bucket of stew or soup, whatever, and the stone is lowered in. And the resulting heat transferred from the stone to the liquid can boil the liquid in three minutes. We've had two gallons of water from stone cold to boiling hot in three minutes on our village. There's not a gas stove on earth can do that. They drank an awful lot of beer in those days and people today seem to think it was just life was one long round of drunkenness. It's unlikely that's how it was or they'd have never got any work done and they'd have all had hangovers, which their phrase for it was to have carpenters in your head. That was the phrase for a hangover in the dark ages. Um, the beer was probably brewed so it was fairly weak and it didn't, didn't have a lot of strength to it. Apart from the fact that it tasted nice and apart from the fact that it did, if it was strong, have a fairly nice effect at an evening event or something. Uh, was that the beer was sterile. It was one of the few sterile drinks they could get. Um, the water from a well, particularly if the toilet pits were nearby, wouldn't be very savoury. And although they knew very little about bacteria and germs, they did know that drinking water from wells and drinking water from streams could actually make you ill. Drinking beer is, is the one drink you can drink that you know will not make you too ill because it's been brewed and the alcohols kill the germs in it. Whilst they didn't know the technical reasons behind that, they knew that's what would happen. Uh, honey, honey was put in the beer to make it stronger for special occasions and then you're getting a drink very similar to mead which is uh, a very strong fortified sort of drink made with honey that ferments because the natural sugar in the honey ferments and makes the alcohol stronger. In fact um, at, at an Anglo-Saxon wedding ceremony they drank a lot of beer with honey in it. Um, they drank beer with honey in it for about a month after the wedding an agreed period of time both families met in each house as the marriage was often arranged they had to get to know each other after the wedding. So they met in the same house and drank beer with honey in it every night together. And they drank it in honour of the moon because the moon was a symbol of women. It was a symbol of fertility, of babies. It was a symbol for women. So they drank beer with honey in it for a month, a moon's month. That's why the period after an Anglo-Saxon wedding was called the honeymoon. as warriors. That is again something which where you see dramatic changes over the whole Saxon period. As far as we understand, early Saxon warriors were basically members of a lord's war band. They probably signed up with somebody who, was, who had a boat to cross the channel and basically they follow him in order to get booty and um, also to perhaps settle on land as a result of their campaigns. You see a little bit of that in a letter of Bede's, um, written in the last year of his life in 735, where he's very, very concerned about the diminution of royal war bands. And he's very concerned that kings have given away too much land to the church. They can't actually reward their followers. And 
therefore have a large enough army to defend the kingdom. Now, these early war bands, so far as we can see, only really operated in the summer. They seem to have operated in a very short period of something like 40 days. They were groups that were called out to fight, basically in a very, very short summer campaigning season. Now, they get hit very hard by the Vikings, because the Vikings don't operate this same system of, of a sort of closed season for fighting. The Vikings, once they've got over here, once they've established themselves in camps, once they're wintering, they're prepared to fight at any time of the year, and indeed all their great successes come in the winter. So what you find is a dramatic change at the end of the 9th century, when Alfred realises that he's got to do something about the military organisation of the kingdom. And as far as we can see, he does two very significant things. First of all, he divides his potential armed forces into two, and those people, those groups, are to serve at different times of the year, so that in fact a larger period of the year is covered by a standing army, if you want. The other thing that Alfred does is he develops towns with walls and he organises a defence for those walls. And you therefore have for these towns, these burrs as they're called, um, a system of defence with men having to man the walls in times of crisis. Although there were trading centres where you could buy and sell goods in a lot of rural communities, which is how most people lived, you had to be fairly self-sufficient. It would be long months before a trader came through or you got the chance to go to a local market. So people tend to make a lot of their own things, particularly their own clothing. Every house would have had some sort of loom in it where they would have woven textiles. Most of it for their own use, very little for sale. Um, the wool came off the back of the sheet fairly dirty and grubby and it had to be washed and then card it to get the fibres straightened. These were done on, on metal or, or bone combs. They do say they used to use teasels as well. We've not had very good results using teasels, but they did actually card the wool to comb it all in the right direction. That got rid of all the bits that you didn't want, all the rubbish that the sheep had picked up while it was wandering around. And that's called discarding, getting rid of all the rubbish you don't want off, off the wool. The wool is then taken off the combs and today the phrase for it is a rollag. You're left with a rollag of wool, and it's like a roll of wool with all the fibres going in roughly the same direction. This is then spun on a spindle wheel, or a drop spindle. Uh, this is pre-spinning wheel days. It was basically a weight like a flywheel, made of lead or stone or bone or clay, and through it ran a thin piece of wood called the spindle. The spindle had a hook at the top to catch the wool, and the wool was wound onto it as it was made. And the way it worked was to, to spin the spindle, and as it spun round and round and round, in a clockwise or anti-clockwise direction, you teased the wool through your fingers that you carded, let go of the spindle well, and it spun the wool round to weave it into a thread. So the wool was woven from that thread, it would be washed. There was a lot of lanolin kept in the wool, the, the chemical that keeps sheep waterproof, because it helped to bind the fibres and helped to make the wool thick. They reckon the estimate is that it was about 10 miles of thread in a dark age man's trousers. So there's an awful lot of wool needed to be spun by the women, the children and the men. The women would carry a spindle wheel around with them all the time. And that's why you find so many spindles, spindle whirls, the lead weights and clay weights in fields, because they were obviously dropping them occasionally and losing them. Um, everybody would have a go at spinning wool. It was then woven on looms, which were wall looms. They leant against the wall and you had a heddle bar which opened out the warp threads which run down the loom. And then you had a, the wool which was passed through, the cross threads, the warp or woof threads were passed through in and out. And each time you move the heddle bar one way or the other, you open the threads in alternate directions to let the woof or weft thread through. And one noise we know you would have heard in a dark age house is the clack thump of a loom, day in, day out, because it was a very intensive process to make that cloth. And in fact, if you look at the way the clothing was made, it was often made with the simplest cut as possible, so as not to waste any of the cloth that had been made. It was very, very valuable. The reign of Alfred is a very difficult one to deal with in Anglo-Saxon history, partly because it's so rich, and it's not just rich because an enormous amount happens in it, 
It's also rich because it's very, very well documented. And it's very well, well documented because Alfred ensured that it was well documented. So you've got a, a propagandist perspective on this. The first thing, obviously, is that Alfred survives the Vikings. I mean, he comes to power in Wessex in 871. At the moment of an extreme Viking crisis, Wessex is just about to keel over uh, under the Viking threat. He lasts through until 899, by which time the Vikings are, in fact, um, really a spent force in terms of invaders in southern England. Alfred was not just a figure who defeated the Vikings. He was a figure who reorganized his kingdom. And part of that reorganization was a religious and cultural reorganization. He probably commissions the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, though we're not absolutely certain about that. One of the great works that he, tra he has translated is, is the pastoral care of Gregory the Great. And he has it sent round to all his bishops informing them of their duties and how they must carry out the pastoral care um, of their flocks. And obviously one of the things underlying this is organising the kingdom on a good Christian basis. And what Alfred had in mind was that if the kingdom was set on a good Christian basis, God would, would reward him for um, his reorganising the kingdom in this way, and God would therefore spare his kingdom the threat of the Vikings. And indeed, in one sense, that is what happened. One of the areas where there is an enormous difference between us and our ancestors from over a thousand years ago is in the field of entertainment. For a start, there wasn't the time to entertain yourself as much as we have today. There wasn't as much leisure time. Uh, most hours of daylight for most people, even the rich, were, were to be used productively to try and create clothing or food or organise something to help in, in life. Probably the one most important type of entertainment from that period, and it's important for us and it was important to them, is, is talking and storytelling. Um, storytelling was essential to them because they weren't what we would call an educated society. They didn't have schools, they didn't have access to libraries, they didn't have access to videos or computers. So the only way to transmit information was orally. Uh, and the best way to transmit it was in the form of a story. The story of Alfred the Great, who can tell how popular storytelling was in the Dark Ages. He was able to trick his way into the Danes' camp by posing as a storyteller. Um, the, the impression you get there is that the Vikings who were encamped didn't actually care who Alfred was or what nationality he was. He was posing as a storyteller and therefore they willingly invited him into their camp because they were bored and wanted entertaining. Traditionally, of course, the end of the Anglo-Saxon period comes at the Battle of Hastings. That's when the Anglo-Saxon kings come to an end. You've got no Anglo-Saxon king after Harold Godwinson. And the government is taken over by Normans. There have, in recent years, been some refinements of this picture. People have tended to emphasise how much of early Norman government was Anglo-Saxon. Um, Doomsday Book couldn't have been compiled without Anglo-Saxon documentation. You also find that the, the Anglo-Saxon age used to be thought of as coming to an end in religious terms with the conquest of England by the Normans and with the institution of Lanfranc as Archbishop of Canterbury. And the emphasis there used to lie on the way in which Lanfranc excluded a whole set of Anglo-Saxon ecclesiastical cults, um, cults of major Anglo-Saxon saints. That again is being downplayed now, and certainly by the end of the 11th century and the beginning of the 12th century, Anglo-Saxon saints are coming back into favour. So although the age in one sense comes to an end very dramatically at Hastings, there are all sorts of fragments of ang the Anglo-Saxon world which continue on into the future. Perhaps one of the most important things that children and the public learn from, from coming and looking around that site, because the general public can wander around it as well and, and meet the people and talk to them. We don't pretend to be real Dark Age people, but they can learn a lot from seeing what people are doing. Uh, and perhaps the most important impression that people go away with 
is, is that our ancestors weren't the unsophisticated bunch of, of idiots. People have often portrayed them as. They were, they were actually very clever people. They were a society capable of, of withstanding amazing adversity uh, and surviving it. But they lived without the modern technology that we have. Uh, and when we look back now with our hindsight, look at the world we live in and how comfortable it is today and how push button our world is, the technology we have at our fingertips, we look back at their life. Um, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing that people survived. It's amazing that people could actually live in those conditions and circumstances, but they did. Uh, human beings have a natural habit of adapting to their lifestyle, to their circumstances they find themselves in. And, and the evidence we have is that life wasn't considered grim by them. It may appear to be grim from where we stand. Uh, a lot of people go around our village and come off saying, I don't know how people could live there, I don't know how they could, uh, how they could have survived, or I couldn't do without my hot water bottle, or I couldn't do without my flask of coffee. They survived, they hadn't got the benefit of hindsight, and therefore they survived. Uh, and, and all evidence is that in the main they lived lives that were fairly happy, shorter than ours, and often ended more violently than ours, but within that life framework they were happy, they had a, a sense of law and order, a strong sense of loyalty to the family and community. And certainly a far greater understanding of their environment than we have. They didn't deforest large areas purely for profit. Uh, and there's, there's ample evidence that if one person was starving in an Anglo-Saxon community, it's probably because everybody was starving. Um, that everybody would work together. They would have to. They were bonded together by the necessity of staying alive.